Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Shoals Marine Labs weekly marine science seminar. I'm Jennifer Seavey. I'm the executive director at Shoals. For any of you who are not familiar with us, Shoals is the largest and oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country. We're jointly operated by both UNH and Cornell. So you can see the logos on our screen behind me. We're located out in the Isles of Shoals on Appledore Island in Maine, about 10 miles offshore of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Every summer, every typical summer, we host these talks on our island for our entire community of students and researchers. And we call them rock talks in order of our, our rocky island. This year, we're bringing our courses and these talks off the island online, and we're really happy to share these marine science talks with you this summer. So our format tonight is a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. If you wanna ask a question, which we highly encourage, you will see a, a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can click that and type in your question. And when we get to the end of the talk, I will read those questions out loud to, our, to Aaron, our speaker, and he can address them. If you have any technical questions as, you're, as we're moving along through the talk, also put those in the Q&A and we'll address them. So without further ado, tonight's talk is Dr. Aaron Rice. He is the principal ecologist at the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics at Cornell's Lab of Ornithology. His research focuses on the production and the perception of sounds by fishes and marine mammals, specifically how animal sounds can be used to examine changes in populations across time and space. He also uses the tools of bioacoustics to study how human activities influence animal populations and their habitats. His work is widely applied by federal, state, local resource managers to protect and, and conserve wildlife species. He has an undergraduate degree from Davidson College. He has a master's from Boston University, and he got a master's and a PhD from the University of Chicago and did postdoc training at Cornell. So his talk tonight is called Calling Whales and Chorusing Fishes as Sentinels of Human Influence on Marine Ecosystems. So, uh, please help me welcome Aaron Rice. I will turn it over to you now, Aaron. Great, thanks for the opportunity. So let me share my screen. All right, so uh, today I'm gonna be talking about some of the highlights uh, from my lab group and, and what we've been working on. Uh, this is just sort of a small sh snapshot of our portfolio of projects, uh, but they sort of all revolve around this theme of using bioacoustics uh, as uh, a survey method and uh, mechanism of studying everything from behavior to ecology uh, to conservation biology on a wide variety of, uh, of taxa and ecosystems around the world. Um, and it's one of these things where acoustics itself is at, at first glance a non-intuitive um, uh, technology to many. Um, and what we have is that you know, with a single way of recording sounds in the environment, we can simultaneously sample for multiple species in environment. And so with this, this really straightforward method of going out into nature, having a recording device, having uh, some sort of a sensor, whether it's a microphone or a hydrophone we record underwater, the, the recordings come in really in, in a similar format. And so um, regardless of where or what or when you're recording, a lot of these things um, end up looking similarly. So just as an example, if we were to go out uh, into a tropical forest, it's, you know, something a little bit more uh, conceptually intuitive to people, you know, what would we hear? You know, um, so this is a recording I made in the Masai Mara um, when traveling, and you could just sort of hear it for a couple of seconds. And in many ways, it doesn't sound too different than what you might hear in your own backyard on a summer evening. You've got some, uh, some sort of high frequency insects, you've got some frogs, you've got some higher frequency uh, squeaks. And so when, when we take this sound recording and we transpose it into the visual domain, it's something, it looks something like this. This is what we would call a spectrogram. 
Um, and so this is the visual representation of sound where you have time on the X axis and frequency on the, on the Y axis. You read it from left to right, uh, similarly like you would read a sheet of music. And so this is a spectrogram of that 20 second recording that I played you from Africa. Um, and you can see a lot of content going on here. But what's particularly exciting is that even with this really short recording, I'm able to get uh, three to four different bat species and a whole host of frog species all with just this single recording. Um, and there's likely a bunch of insects in there as well. And so when you start taking this approach, um, you quickly see that being able to record out in the natural world is an extremely powerful uh, data collection uh, method. So if we take this sort of, you know, whether it's a backyard soundscape or if you've been on, you know, safari in Africa, um, sort of this idea of sounds, it starts to become pretty intuitive about how different sounds um, uh, sort of persist across different types of environments. So if you think about this sort of on a continuum of a pristine to a highly uh, human influence system, you know, imagine being somewhere uh, in the Rockies where you might have this lovely pristine uh, stream flowing, and, you know, in a, a situation like this, you're going to hear some birds, you're going to hear frogs, you're going to hear the wind moving, um, maybe some ungulates moving through, maybe some coyotes or wolves in the distance. And it's not, it's really pretty straightforward to envision how a scene like this would sound completely different uh, than a scene like this. Um, in a number of different uh, dimensions, certainly human influence being uh, chief among them. And so within this terrestrial example of things that may be more familiar to us, we can also extend this continuum of sounds in uh, the perspective of human influence for the marine environment, where it's pretty intuitive too to think about this lovely isolated beach uh, with waves crashing, maybe some uh, fish calling, some snapping shrimp. Um, this uh, pristine looking beach is going to sound uh, completely different than something like New York Harbor, you know, or these major seaports in the world um, where, that are going to have ships in construction. And, you know, you can even hear. Um, rush hour traffic uh, propagate through different roads. And so, you know, what we can do is start to take our approach of, of recording sounds in nature and really understand how do these systems, these ecosystems work, um, how does noise um, uh, influence them, um, and sort of what are the rules by which they operate. And so as a sort of in studying the ocean, um, what's become in increasingly clear since one of the first papers in 2008 and then a follow-on paper is that human impacts on ocean systems are pervasive uh, around the world. And so this paper from Ben Halpern's group uh, published in Nature Communication shows an updated map um, of cumulative impacts on marine ecosystems around the world um, where those warmer colors and oranges and reds uh, in degree, indicate high degrees of impact and the cooler colors indicate, indicate lower degrees of impact. And you can see areas along the, uh, the US Atlantic coast are, are fairly red. There's a couple of blue spots in there. Um, a lot of these lines extending across the Atlantic basin are, uh, correspond to shipping traffic. Um, you see, but other components uh, in uh, playing a role in these uh, human impacts are things like climate change and fishing and shipping, um, oil and gas exploration. And sort of this is sort of this cumulative map of the human footprint on the world's oceans. And in many things that humans do um, in, in ocean systems, uh, noise is a, a, a component of that, um, of those activities. So whether it's, you know, offshore construction for, for um, uh, oil and gas extraction or, um, or fishing boats or wind turbines or commercial shipping, uh, all of these have their own degree uh, contribution of noise uh, to these ocean environments. And in recent decades, uh, ocean noise levels have increased about a thousand fold um, since what they were in pre-industrial times. Um, so this sort of sets this humbling um, and somewhat daunting stage of the plight of the oceans uh, and really a race to understand um, what are fundamentally very poorly understood ecosystems. So when we think about this from a conservation perspective, um, in conservation biology writ large, we have these really central questions about how we approach um, trying to identify uh, what are actionable conservation goals. So uh, first and foremost, we want to know in a particular ecosystem, what's there? What are the species that are occurring? We want to know how many are there. Um, we, is it low density, high density? We want to know when are they there? Where are they occurring within an ecosystem? What are they doing there? Um, 
And then from the human influence perspective, you know, where, what are those things about their biology that makes them vulnerable to different activities? Um, something that we think about in the framework of risk. And then in areas where humans are um, operating, you know, how can we in fact mitigate um, the risk of impact, particularly in data poor areas? There are more places in the ocean that we know very little about um, than we have a really good understanding. And even in a, along the US Atlantic coast, um, uh, I'll give a couple of case studies where we actually understand very little about what's there um, and how does that lack of data, available data, guide our uh, decision making. So within the context of acoustic communication, where I get really excited about it as a discipline is this ability to integrate information at multiple hierarchical levels of biological organization. We can go from understanding processes at the level of the organism all the way up to understanding ecosystem processes. Um, and sort of to paint this picture in the, from the perspective of fishes, um, but the same is true for really all animals. We, you know, we can start within the organism looking at sort of the anatomical and physiological level where um, you know, on this top um, uh, uh, histology state, uh, section here, you have the, the hindbrain of a fish with these really, really dense and dedicated uh, nerve bundles um, dedicated for sound production. On the lower left is the swim bladder, which is a dedicated sonic muscle uh, for, the, for the toadfish. Uh, and then you have a schematic of a fish ear. So we have these both sound producing mechanisms and auditory mechanisms. These give rise to acoustic behavior where you have uh, regardless of, of the species, most uh, vertebrates are, um, are acoustically communicating in either reproductive or agonistic contexts, whether they're attract, uh, trying to attract mates, um, synchronize uh, reproductive activities, um, or defend territories. We can go from this sort of dyad of male and female interactions and scale up yet again uh, to population ecology, that by listening to uh, groups of animals of the same species, we can figure out when do we have the onset of a reproductive activity, when are they in a certain area, uh, and then from population we can scale up to ecosystem, whereby having sensors in the field, we're kept capturing not one, but a multitude of different species that are there. And so we can go sort of up and down um, this hierarchy, answering a variety of questions at each of these different levels. So within uh, my lab group and, and a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past uh, five or 10 years or so, I've had the good fortune of being able to work all over around the world. And so each of these red dots uh, sort of represent areas where I've been able to uh, deploy recorders. Sadly, I haven't been able to spend a whole lot of time in Greenland, but we did a couple of projects there. Um, and so in the absence of being able to study them, it's still kind of pretty exciting to see what these soundscapes are like when they come back to, uh, to Ithaca. And so, you know, just to give you a, uh, sort of the context in which this uh, research program is developed, you know, really what started for me was that um, in transitioning from a postdoc to being a staff scientist within Cornell, you know, we started with a handful of projects looking at um, baleen whales in the Western North Atlantic. Sort of that gave rise to a bunch of uh, fish related projects. Um, and then more uh, marine mammal projects and more far reaching areas around the world. And then some more fish projects um, in other areas of the world. And then being able to take some of these approaches that had been developed in the marine domain and then applying to them to some terrestrial examples, whether it's looking at lyrebird song connectivity in Southern Australia, um, or being able to look at uh, endangered frogs or birds um, in the US Southwest. And then in this case uh, in Chile, uh, being able to use um, sounds for um, diver detection for illegal fishing. And so within this uh, portfolio of different projects, you know, we've, we've collected around 3 million hours of underwater sound. But again, what you see here is this uh, broad uh, diversity of using bioacoustics uh, across many different taxa and ecosystems. 3 million hours takes up a lot of space. It's about currently about 400 terabytes of data. Um, so you quickly get into data management issues and trying to um, wade through all of this. You know, with, with 3 million hours of sound, you start to get into this domain of being able to record more sound than you as an individual could listen to in a lifetime. And so what that requires is a number of different strategies for being able to get through this data as efficiently as possible. And the motivation for most of these projects has really been in the context of evaluating impacts to protected species uh, or imperiled habitats. So just to give you just a, a, a quick idea of sort of the workflow. So let's say you go out and you record a bunch of, um, of critters and you bring back the data. How, do, how does this all work? So you're 
uh, digital data would come back to the lab, you would run it through any number of specialized software packages. These range from, there are freeware applications to do this, uh, to highly specialized custom software approaches. You could go through the data in the software packages, either um, uh, you know, sort of with human review and visually identifying different things, or you can use uh, artificial intelligence and automated detection approaches to find particular species of interest. And really what you want to be able to get at or, or identified sounds. So if you see these little um, uh, cartoon thumbnails here, what these represent are the signature sounds of within a spectrogram of particular uh, species of interest. And with these, um, once you start annotating these sounds, you can start building both temporal and spatial records of occurrence. So by looking at the number of uh, toadfish or sea trout calls per unit time, we could start getting an idea of calling rates as a function of, of season, where we can look at where on a map um, these uh, species are detected. And so we get into this approach where the timestamp, and it's really the acoustic metadata of these sounds, becomes equally as important as the sounds themselves for understanding these, um, these occurrence patterns of different species or, um, in different ecosystems. So what I want to do is just give a, a, a snapshot of, of a few different projects that we've been working on up and down the Atlantic coast um, that sort of show the utility of, of bioacoustics um, and marine conservation in different cases. Um, and so it's looking at uh, migrating whales and, and uh, U.S. Atlantic wind farm uh, areas, uh, looking at uh, climate change influences on fish spawning patterns, uh, looking at how does freshwater management in South Florida influence um, community assembly of different fish species and how do they respond to it, um, and then just a, a quick summary. So to start with uh, migrating whales, um, in the U.S. Uh, Atlantic coast, there are six species of baleen whales that are found. All of them are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, I think five, four of the six are protected under the Endangered Species Act, but really what's driving nearly all of the regulatory concern uh, in the context of, of offshore wind uh, is the North Atlantic right whale. So this is this iconic species that up until the 50s we thought was extinct um, from uh, industrial whaling era. Um, the species recovered and then started declining. There's currently about 400 individuals. Um, and in uh, the last couple of years, there was an unusual mortality event where um, an alarming number, up, almost up to 10% of the, the entire species had died in, in different entanglements uh, in the Northern Gulf of Maine. So uh, a fairly alarming, um, status for the species and it's by no means uh, has a, a certain future which is a discussion for um, another time. But with right whales as they migrate they have this distinctive uh, vocalization so I'll just sort of play it. Um, and so it's you know not a particularly uh, complex sound it's this uh, about one second long uh, frequency modulated upsweep you can see it here. Um, and this is, we think, used as a contact call where you have uh, individuals as they migrate calling to each other. Um, and we've been able to design automated detection algorithms such that we can train the computer to go find these things uh, rather than having uh, to sort of listen to or look at uh, all of the data ourselves. So it, with the ecology of, of North Atlantic right whales, um, they're found um, these days uh, really along the US Atlantic coast going up to uh, Canada. Um, and they spend their summers in their, the, the summer feeding grounds in the Gulf of Maine um, and the Bay of Fundy. And then uh, females, uh, pregnant females will go down to the winter calving grounds uh, in November and give birth to calves there. And then we have this spring and fall migration of animals going back and forth. Um, and this has really been sort of the paradigm for how we think about the population ecology of the species and has driven a lot of management. So with activities along the, uh, the US Mid-Atlantic, you know, the idea is, well, if the whales are in the north in the summer and they're in the, the, uh, the south in the winter, you know, that means that there's low risk of having any impacts to them during these, uh, these time periods. And what we've been finding again and again um, in these different uh, sites um, indicated by green circles is that right whales are regularly occurring outside of what we thought was this, quote, normal uh, migratory season. So, Basically, everywhere we listen, uh, we're finding right whales when they're not supposed to be there. Um, and so it raises the question fundamentally, um, did we actually have a poor understanding of what they did in the first place, um, or is their ecology changing? And so I think in many ways, you know, what we have to do is sort of set a new baseline for what is the species doing now and how do we manage it uh, and conserve it um, given this, this present day situation. 
So it's no secret that within, uh, along the Atlantic coast, um, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has eyed uh, a number of different sites managed at the different at the state level of different uh, offshore wind planning areas, and so these are indicated in yellow with this the the responsible state um, uh, indicated with the initials there, um, and you can see that a number of different states have developed offshore uh, wind planning areas, um, and this directly overlaps with this migratory pathway of the right whale, and so we fundamentally have this challenge of how do you facilitate offshore wind um, and sort of recognize the, the value of renewable energy and then mitigate risk to this highly imperiled species. And so this is where we get into this idea of using baseline data for conservation planning. So when most of these wind planning areas were proposed, there were, there were few, if any, survey data on what protected species are occurring there. And so if you're gonna build a wind farm and you are tasked you know, and you, you are legally obligated to do no harm or minimize harm to endangered species, um, how do you go about doing that? And so uh, my lab has been brought in in many ways to start documenting baleen whale occurrence before wind energy um, activities occur. You know, and so we don't know when whales are there, we don't know how long they're there, is it true that they're limited there to you know um, spring and fall um, and they're not there during those times you know during the summer which would be an ideal construction season for offshore wind turbines um, or is there more of a risk and so what we want to then be able to do is that with this baseline data in hand be able to uh, compare it to future occurrence and evaluate did something like offshore uh, wind farm construction uh, cause any changes on the movement patterns um, or, or population numbers or behavior uh, of these species and ideally being able to inform, um, use this both baseline data as well as before and after uh, to inform management decisions to mitigate impacts. Um, and the fundamental approach to this is really being able to use, uh, provide better data for more effective management and conservation. So, you know, this is really a case of adaptive management and being able to learn as you go, um, both within changing ecologies and advances in, in technology to really improve conservation outcomes. So uh, as this case study in the Maryland wind energy area, um, on the left, you have the, the coast of Maryland with Ocean City sort of uh, at the top of this coastline. These, um, those two diagonal squares extending down from the top are shipping lanes um, coming out of Delaware Bay. And the wind lease area are these yellow uh, squares that are indicated both as lease blocks and sub blocks. Um, and so, uh, the, the developer, U.S. Wind, uh, basically leased this parcel um, from, the, from the U.S. government um, and wanted to, to plan a wind farm. And so if you want to plan a wind farm, how do you go about uh, assessing risk for protected species? Well, one way to start is going, looking at available existing observational data. Um, you know, and so a data repository for that is OBIS CMAP hosted um, by Duke. And so you could look at, okay, well, show me what do we have with right whale sightings uh, in this area that are previously collected. Well, we know this database goes back to, you know, there are data records in the, from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and there's a handful of right whales. You can see over on the left-hand side near the coast, uh, right whales, you know, single right whales in 1976 uh, and 1973, and then a handful of right whales um, in the, the uh, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016. But again, these data raise the question, um, is this just a few individuals or are we just, uh, only uh, capturing just a small percentage of those um, that are moving through. For humpback whales, it's somewhat similar. Um, you know, humpback whales also uh, engage in this north-south uh, migratory behavior. And there's a few uh, sightings ranging from 1964 all the way to 2014. But again, these data don't help address the uh, uh, answer the question, is this just a low number of individuals or do we have a really low detection probability uh, for these migrating species? Fin whales are a little bit better, um, lots of fin whales in the area. And so given that uh, planning these wind farms is a multi-billion dollar endeavor, um, you know, and seeking to provide a substantial amount of uh, a renewable energy to major uh, cities along the Atlantic coast, um, protected species uh, compliant, protection and environmental compliance under the Endangered Species Act is really a critical question. And so whether it's in the case of right whales or humpback whales, both of which are legally protected, do you feel comfortable wagering a billion dollars uh, building a wind farm? Uh, and how sure are you that you're not going to impact the life history of these species? So with that stage, 
you know, we can, the specific objectives for this project were to quantify the occurrence of baleen whales along the Maryland coast and in the wind energy area, being able to uh, establish temporal and spatial patterns of habitat use, um, and then sort of evaluate uh, risk to, uh, to whales, specifically right whales, uh, with the idea of wind farm construction. So we took our trusty uh, recording unit, the Marine Autonomous Recording Unit. Um, it's about the size of a beach ball. We can deploy it down to about 5,000 feet. Um, and it's essentially a giant hard drive with batteries connected to a hydrophone in a pressure housing. Um, and so we throw them over, water, uh, over the side of the boat. They record for four to six months, um, and then we bring them back. Um, and here we basically collected data uh, for nearly three years continuously uh, with these 10 devices. So even this project alone is pretty much resulting in around 30 years of audio data uh, coming from it. So with the wind energy area, this is sort of our deployment map with each of these red dots uh, representing the location of one of our recording devices. And for um, the sake of aggregating data that I'm gonna show you um, in a couple minutes, uh, we sort of classified these regions into this inshore, the wind energy area, and offshore uh, regions. And so for our acoustic analysis, we really wanted to focus on three baleen whale species. We looked at a couple uh, blue whales and minke whales that we don't show data here, and they were pretty rare, but the most common ones were right whales, fin whales, and humpback whales. Um, and these spectrograms just sort of show you the differences in their calling patterns. Um, we looked at uh, the occurrence of these specific calls on each unit uh, using a combination of artificial intelligence algorithms and uh, human review. Um, and then with the right whales, I'll show you how we did this, uh, we were able to um, acoustically locate them in space and, and being able to look at the, the spatial position of their calling. So um, going into this, we really had um, not much in the way of any understanding of temporal patterns of, of uh, whale occurrence in this area. And so what we see here over three years is uh, these sort of striking patterns. So this is for North Atlantic right whales. And you can see the inshore um, uh, units on the left, the wind energy units on the, in the, the middle box, and the offshore units on the right. And we can see both seasonal peaks and lulls of the, uh, the number of days per uh, month represented as, as a percentage uh, when they are there. So what you see are both peaks of occurrence in the winter um, and a decrease in the spring, but then a secondary peak um, in May, June, July, in many cases. And then on, on the offshore units, there's more whales uh, that are detected. And so if you're trying to plan around, plan your construction activities around when right whales aren't there, um, this would give you an idea of when are they there, when are they not. Um, and one of the, the, really the take home messages is that, you know, there are certainly times of the year when uh, whales are most frequently occurring um, but there are very few periods in which whales are, uh, are not there, as well as the, the seasonality uh, seems to change across different years. So you can very clearly see that in the wind energy area, we see quite a bit of uh, variability as to when, the, when they are most frequent in an area. Um, in year one, it's sort of the February, year two is April, and then in year three, it's December, January. So that's the pattern for right whales. Here's what we see for humpback whales, sort of a lower occurrence. Um, in the inshore area, um, but then you know a couple of really distinct uh, seasonal peaks in the inside the wind energy area, and then uh, you know two major and then a, a third minor uh, peak offshore. And then for fin whales, um, certainly offshore uh, uh, fin whales are detected most of the year, but then we see um, on the wind energy area and inshore units um, an increase in occurrence in the in the fall and winter um, time periods compared to uh, to spring and summer. So that's sort of the, the temporal occurrence um, perspective on things. Now with acoustic localization, this is really time intensive. Um, and so we really spent our time focusing on right whales. Um, and so the way this works is that if you had your hypothetical right whale who, let's say they are calling here and they emit a sound, that single sound would be detected on uh, different units. Um, and because uh, the, those recording units are different distances to that calling whale, the sound would arrive on those units at different times. And so we can use what is called a time difference of arrival uh, to triangulate um, their position. And so when you're looking at a multi-channel spectrogram with each recording unit um, sort of on a different line, it, start, it starts to look like this. So you can see that this little red box in the spectrogram on the bottom is the first arrival of this call um, and suggesting that on channel nine, it's closest to that sensor 
and then based on the occurrence patterns of when that same sound showed up on the other units, uh, we could figure out where it is in space and time. And over the three uh, years of the project, our location map starts to look like this, where we've got right whales over the entire area. That black box um, drawn around the wind energy site um, sort of is sort of that confidence line where uh, outside of that, we're not really certain of the, of the precision of the calls, so, so we ignored those, but we're um, pretty confident about the spatial locations uh, within the box. And so this is what that occurrence map looks like. Um, and the, you know, you can, we can tease this apart as a function of year or season. But what I found to be really interesting is that for the, these almost 2,000 calls uh, that we were able to localize, um, we can start building a, a density map and being able to look at where are the most dense parcels of ocean in which uh, whales are, are calling from. And that starts to look like this. So we interpolated those points. Um, and so you, uh, here you can see that the highest uh, area of right whale call density is sort of in this southeast uh, corner of the, of the wind energy indicated in that sort of bright red um, uh, oval. So with the wind energy area, um, you know, we have this giant parcel of ocean. And I think when most people think about offshore wind farms, you know, in the US, what comes to mind is something like this. This is the Block Island wind farm uh, off of Block Island uh, in the state of Rhode Island, where this is a, an experimental wind farm with about seven turbines that have been currently deployed. Um, and this has been operating for, for a couple of years. Um, but when we, as we go from an experimental level uh, test uh, uh, wind farm uh, and we move into sort of the industry scale, um, wind farm to try to provide power to major U.S. cities, the density of um, and the number of, of wind turbines increases uh, dramatically. So this is the or was the proposed uh, turbine layout uh, within the um, Maryland wind planning area. So with each of these black dots representing where one of the turbines would go uh, and connected by um, different cables as indicated by the line. And so this this plan is, is, has now been uh, updated. This is the older map, but it gives you an idea of when we think about industry scale offshore wind, this is what it starts to look like. So now we can reconcile this uh, turbine location proposal with our density map for right whales. Um, and it starts to look something like this, where you can see that if you were going to be designing a, um, a construction schedule, what you may want to do is figure out, okay, if the Southeast uh, portion of the wind energy area um, has the highest likelihood of interactions with right whales, you may want to focus on building out there first when whales are not in the area. And then during whale peak season, uh, you can focus on other uh, uh, areas of the, of the lease block. So this just gives you an idea of how we can use both the available planning data from the developer uh, com and combine it with our offshore, with our, uh, the bioacoustic survey data. So just to quickly summarize, um, we got right whales and, um, and humpbacks in October through April. Uh, fin whales are nearly year round. Uh, right whales, are we can locate them across the wind planning area um, and we can use these data uh, to help mitigate risks from wind farm development. So th that's Maryland. Um, let's drop down a little bit to uh, North Florida and switch over from whales uh, to fish. But as we start as I'm, you know, presenting data and talking through the methods, you're going to quickly see that a lot of these same concepts are the same for fish as they are for, uh, for the whales. So here, what's, what's really great about uh, fishes and, and bioacoustics compared to marine mammals that we can actually start tracing uh, and having a better understanding or experimentally testing how they're using sounds uh, in different behavioral contexts. And so, so like I mentioned earlier, similar to other tetrapods, uh, fish are vocalizing in different reproductive contexts. Um, and temperature plays a really important cue in the timing of a lot of fish behavior. Um, and so what this starts to raise the question that we're now facing a warming ocean uh, driven by climate change. So what is the relationship between uh, increases in, sea, in uh, ocean temperature and uh, fish reproductive ecology? And so here we took this data set and wanting to look at, you know, what is the role of uh, coursing fish species in their acoustic habitat? Um, do we see uh, detectable seasonal patterns and what are the relationships between this calling phenology um, and, uh, and, and climate change. So here we um, are two study species. On the left you have the oyster toadfish, a model system for a number of reasons of biology, um, has a distinctive uh, call known as the boat whistle. It sounds like this, sort of this honk. 
And if you're snorkeling or diving off of a uh, you know, place like Woods Hole or south of Cape Cod, um, you'll hear these guys uh, calling in, in the summer. Um, it, it's pretty distinctive and pretty loud. On the right, we have the black drum, Pagonius chromus, um, primarily ranges from south of Cape Cod all the way down to Argentina. However, there have been a few reports of black drum caught within the Gulf of Maine um, over the past couple of decades, but it's, it's really outside of their, uh, their normal range. Uh, and black drum are, are pretty special. Um, they're ridiculously loud. They have a source level of 165 decibels underwater, which if you do the conversion to, to in air uh, decibel level, um, it's about the equivalent of standing three feet away from a jackhammer. Um, so really impressive. And they'll, these fish will sort of aggregate uh, when they go into a reproductive mode. And so this is sort of what their um, sort of low density calling is like, where you have a few isolated calls. Maybe difficult to hear on speakers just because it is so low frequency, but it's sort of like this booming noise. Um, yeah, I'm not really hearing it. Um, but then when they go into peak chorusing, it's just a giant smear of calls, one on top of the other, an absolute cacophony. And so you can sort of hear the booming noise. And so with these calls in the spectrogram, they're pretty distinctive. So you can see not only these individual calls uh, on the top, but also what the chorus starts to look like with these um, uh, harmonic bands that are they're really diagnostic of the species. Um, so we took our critters and we had, for, as part of a right whale survey actually, we had this recorder uh, deployed about 17 miles offshore of Jacksonville, Florida, uh, as indicated by that red dot. Um, and we had been uh, recording for about uh, six years or so. And when we brought back the data to the lab, um, after we started looking at uh, the right whales and sort of checked those boxes off, I started noticing there was really a bunch of fish on the recording that was, that was pretty exciting. And so, um, we've got about six years of data and 1,029 total days of, of continuous recording. So these were seasonal surveys. So we take our, let's take 30 seconds of sound. So you can see in the inset in the upper right what those individual calls look like for both black drum and toadfish. Um, black drum call really one on top of another, whereas toadfish are a little bit more polite and they sort of take their time. Um, but this is, you know, what 30 seconds uh, would look like. You could listen to this pretty easily. Um, and it's a pretty manageable level of sound. And you can see the different frequency bands um, as well as the different calling patterns. So we can take 30 seconds of sound and we can now zoom out uh, to this is what 24 hours of sound looks like, where for the black drum, we see these really pronounced uh, nocturnal chorus that starts at about 6 p.m. and continues to about 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, and you can see that by the, uh, the really clear um, uh, frequency bands that are occurring. And then toadfish sort of call throughout the day, um, as indicated by these horizontal lines. Um, that extend from, from left to right. And things like passing ships or storms um, sort of wash out in this, the, this representation of sound. You know, even though they may be a couple hours long, um, they're really they, uh, trivial in comparison to the contribution uh, to, to the, the environment of these different fish sounds. So if this is 24 hours of sound, this is five months. So if you started listening now, uh, you would finish sometime uh, in uh, November or December. And so what really pops out here is you can start to see the black drum chorus that starts at about March 1st. Um, and then uh, you, you can see then uh, toadfish start at about April 1. Um, and they sort of continue throughout the remainder of the survey. And so if this is five months, this is now what six years looks like. That for each of these seasonal spectrograms, each of which about four to five months in duration, we can track the onset and duration of the spawning season of black drum and toadfish just by looking at their calls. Um, and so even this is, is, a, is a pretty quick way uh, to look at a lot of population level data um, all at the same time. So we were able to take um, remote sensing uh, satellite derived sea surface temperature data for this location over years in, um, of the survey. And you can see that there's actually quite a bit of temperature variation um, on a given year, anywhere from about uh, five or 10 degrees. Um, and what I did was then take these temperature data and sort of transpose it uh, from left to right with a, with a color ramp with the coldest temperatures being in blue and the warmest temperatures being in red and it looks like this. And then we can do an overlay of, these of the temperature data on top of our spectrogram to start looking at patterns of how does um, uh, black drum and toadfish um, uh, calling behavior correspond to highs and low, lows in, uh, in water temperature. And to look at some actual data, um, 
So there is a significant relationship between um, uh, chorusing and water temperature. But not only that, you also see an increase in the, uh, the fundamental frequency of the fishes, excuse me, calls as a function of water temperature as well. And here is a case um, where you, the sounds are produced by contracting muscles. And the hypothesis is that as the sounds, um, as the, excuse me, as the water warms up, the muscles contract faster and they raise the frequency of the call. So basically the pitch is shifting uh, with warming oceans. So just to uh, go through the, the take home messages here, um, these two species of fish are the dominant sounds in this coastal uh, ecosystem. You know, at these long-term acoustic views, these are the, really the species that pop out and everything else sort of uh, is not nearly as, as prominent. Um, we do get a, a consistent pattern in the sequence of calling behavior for both black drum and toadfish, um, but the onset and the duration of the call, of coursing behavior is related to water temperature. Um, and, and certainly, like I mentioned, the fundamental frequency is, is positively correlated uh, with water temperature as well. Um, so uh, switching over uh, quickly to our last case study, uh, going down to um, South Florida. Um, anybody that knows anything about South Florida, um, basically the urban development and, and habitation of uh, human uh, habitation of South Florida is um, possible because of the freshwater drainage from Lake Okeechobee, this giant black dot um, at the top of this map that then extends south and washes out through Everglades National Park into the Gulf of Mexico. And as freshwater flows from Lake Okeechobee, it provides drinking water to Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Um, it provides uh, fresh water for agriculture. And then the, uh, that which is left over then washes out through the Everglades. And this freshwater flow is actively managed both by the state of Florida uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And so the, the management of this freshwater raises the question, well, what is it doing for the extensive fish populations uh, that are occurring in Florida Bay? Uh, Florida Bay has an ecosystem service value of about $52 billion a year, um, both from fisheries uh, as well as tourism. Um, so uh, there's quite a bit of ecological significance, but yet despite all of the efforts um, with water management uh, and the Everglades, we really don't have a good understanding of what, what fish uh, are doing in response to these changes. And so uh, with, with acoustics, you know, we can look at both species diversity, abundance, as well as the condition and health uh, of these different ecosystems. And so here's a case where in looking at the success of restoration efforts, I mean, again, uh, Everglades restoration is between an, uh, approximately a $10 billion endeavor. Um, we can look at how changes in behavior may precede uh, population level increases or decreases for these different species. And when we started working with the Park Service um, on this project, we got, I got really excited because it's an opportunity to look at changes in fish ecology through this lens of acoustics. And here we, is a case where we have likely over 100 different species of sonic fish all living within Florida Bay. So if we zoom in to Everglades National Park, the park boundary is drawn by this yellow line and our recording sites are indicated by uh, yellow and red circles. The yellow circles are uh, places where I'm gonna show data today, um, but we have data for all of these other red sites as well. And the, we took advantage of being able to mount recording devices on these existing um, USGS and National Park Service water monitoring stations um, that are throughout the bay um, where we can sort of capitalize on synchronous uh, water temperature measurements uh, or water quality measurements um, and then also be able to collect concurrent acoustic data. Um, and here, what I'm going to show you now are data from uh, sister species of the oyster toadfish, the Gulf toadfish, um, that is found throughout um, Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but we're working up uh, species uh, acoustics on, for, uh, for other taxa. So uh, jumping over to the environmental data, you can see that these three sites have a clear gradation in salinity, which um, in the case of Joe Bay, which is one of the uh, more northerly sites, has an increase in salinity over the course of the, of the spring season. Um, and then if you look at temperature, the uh, sort of um, median temperature is about the same. Each site has similar increases and decreases uh, in water temperature, uh, but then also seasonal shifts as well. And you can see sort of the mean uh, the summation of these on this right uh, box plots on the right where there's a clear difference in salinity uh, but temperature is is not significantly different uh, from the three different sites. If we look at toadfish calling as a function of location we see differences in toadfish calling activity as a function of salinity where we have the, the highest amount of toadfish calling in our low salinity or lowest 
uh, salinity environment. Um, and then if we model the continuous relationship of calling activity as a function of salinity, uh, we see significant decreases in calling activity as a function um, of, of salinity with a 14% calling decrease uh, per one part per thousand uh, increase in salinity. Um, we also looked at temperature and what was really striking here was I, you know, similar to the black drum and toadfish story I uh, showed you earlier, we generated a long-term spectrogram uh, from one of the sites. And sure enough, this is what popped out where this red band that you sort of see at that around that 300 Hertz uh, uh, frequency range are the calls from uh, Gulf toadfish. And when I look at sort of the, the peaks and troughs of these uh, fundamental frequencies, it looks extremely reminiscent of the temperature profile that we saw that I showed you um, a couple slides before. And so if we plot temperature on top of the spectrogram directly, we get a really nice match. And so here's a case where you can see how the calls and the calling behavior of these fish are really responding directly to temperature, to water temperature. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. And so this project is uh, sort of in its early stages, but we're being able to sort of develop this case of using Gulf toadfish as an acoustic indicator species, um, and then switching over to uh, what we can understand about uh, restoration and management of the system. Um, so here, uh, toadfish exhibit this graded and predictable response um, to both salinity and temperature. And because of this, we think that they are gonna be a useful indicator species um, and where we can understand broader ecosystem processes just by listening to, uh, to these fish. Um, we may be able to look at how our toadfish and other uh, sonic species responding to other types of uh, environmental change. Florida Bay is plagued by uh, seagrass die-offs, harmful algal blooms, uh, hypoxic events, which wreak havoc uh, on, the, on the habitat. Um, and so it raises the question, could you use fish sounds as an uh, indication of biotic response uh, to these uh, uh, changes in habitat? And then uh, the stuff that's ongoing are being able to look at the recovery trajectory of one of these major seagrass die-offs um, from 2017, 2018, understanding the drivers of spatial heterogeneity. We see even with two closely related sites or closely positioned sites in Florida Bay, we see wildly different calling behavior in the same species. So um, that we wanna understand why is that happening? Um, and then being able to increase the number of species that, uh, that we're analyzing. In addition to toadfish, we currently have data on spotted sea trout, which is a major fishery species, uh, sport fish species, as well as snapping shrimp, but there's a whole handful of other species that we'll, we can go after. And then being able to train uh, the computer to um, sort of do this more automatically to make it less labor intensive. So with that whirlwind of data, uh, the take home messages that I wanna leave you with now for this before we switch over to questions is how bioacoustics in the marine environment provides a way to understand and mitigate impacts of human activities on different marine vertebrates. We can look at large scale patterns uh, in calling behavior um, that may precede larger regime sh uh, shifts within the ecosystem. Um, and we can use fish sounds uh, as an indicator to understand mechanisms and patterns of ecological change. And you know, within this approach, we can address uh, questions both at the basic and more applied uh, ecological level. So before I stop talking, um, I'm really fortunate to work with a great team of people um, uh, everything from, from postdocs, signal processing engineers, uh, research technicians, uh, a deployment team, and without their help could never have been, uh, been able to do all of this. And I would like to thank my different collaborators uh, and then the various funding sources that have supported our work along the way. So uh, happy to entertain questions now, um, but if uh, people wanna follow up, I've got my contact information at the bottom of the slide uh, and I can leave this up uh, as well. Um, so thank you for your, uh, for your time uh, and, uh, yeah, and I very much appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Aaron. That was really interesting. Uh, yeah, I liked it a lot. Um, and uh, I just want to remind people that you can put your questions in the Q&A. So there were a couple of people with their hands raised, um, like Deb and Kevin. You can put your questions in the Q&A. And I wanted to let everyone know that Aaron has graciously agreed to answer everybody's questions, even if we don't get to them. So we'll send them to him and he'll reply to you over email. So, so that's great because we just, we have about 10 minutes. So Jackie Webb, who I think you might know, um, says hello, Aaron, and she and Ingrid have kind of a very similar question about whales. Mm -hmm. Your analysis 
kind of implies that you can identify individual whales because there's so many whales out there calling. How can you separate them into individuals if you can't identify the uh, individual? Well, let's see, so great question. Um, and so the, the, there's a couple of different answers that I think I will try to <laughs> tie together. Um, so certainly one approach is that, so it's really difficult to distinguish whales. One of the holy grails, particularly in field acoustics, is being able to look at sort of individual signatures within the acoustics of different species. So uh, my friend and collaborator um, up at uh, Syracuse University, Susan Parks, has found sort of an individual identity uh, in right whale calls where they can identify individuals, but those are from on animal recording tags, not necessarily from bottom mounted sensors. So being able to, to get at individuals um, is hard. So what in the case of the density map that I showed, those aren't the density of individuals. Those are the density of where calls occur. And so that could conceivably be, you know, as, as a uh, very simplified example, that could, that could be one whale who happens to be just calling uh, throughout the, the survey, and then we would have picked out where it was recording, uh, or where we, where we picked it up. Um, but it is some uh, sort of unknown number of groups uh, of individuals that are, that are calling. And so there are a number of uh, statistical modeling approaches now where we can start to estimate, well, what are the call rates of the individuals? Um, what's a, their detection range? What's the probability of detection? And then we can start working up uh, different um, predictions of what density and abundance may look like through the acoustics themselves. Those statistical models um, are tricky. They don't necessarily take into account seasonal variation in calling or individual uh, preferences or differences in, in calling activity. Um, and so it's sort of one of the forefronts of, of management of being, trying to be able to take the acoustic survey data and really work it into a, an abundance or density estimate um, to make it more comparable with, uh, with some of the visual survey stuff. So related to that, uh, mm -hmm. Denny's asking, your analysis of whale density assumes that the whales vocalize at the same, same rate independent of the time of year. And is there any seasonal dependence for how often they would vocalize? And yes. could there appear to be more whales present when they're actually just vocalizing more? Sure, absolutely. So the, you know, and again, with, with whale density, I, I, it should have been labeled call density, or maybe it was. Uh, but again, it's the, you know, we're not trying to get at the number of individuals that are there. And so really, you know, it's, it's actually astonishing that for the, the amount of attention devoted to right whales, we really don't have any uh, understanding of seasonal variation in individual calling behavior, um, both because it's logistically difficult uh, to do, but it, it hasn't been addressed yet. So um, I think that there, there absolutely could you know, look like if there was an increase in calling activity of individuals, that very well may look like a higher number of individuals within an area. And so that's absolutely, before working up to a density or abundance estimate, that's something that you would actually want to take into account. Okay, someone else is asking, if you have salinity and temperature data, what information does toadfish calling indicate to us? What is the ecological significance of a toadfish call? And what can it say about other species? So um, there's, a, there's a couple of different things. So um, in terms of ecological significance, so we know one of the things that's really fascinating about toadfish is that this is a family of fishes, not, you know, not unique to toadfish, um, but that really make their living through sound. Um, that, that sound is, uh, is fundamental um, and required for uh, mating uh, and reproduction in the species. And so, um, you know, in making, in, trying to, you know, understanding a species or studying a species that for which sound is so critical, um, the, the sounds themselves provide really good insight for what the species is doing. Now, the, in the case of toadfish, arguably more so uh, black drum, one of the issues is this idea of acoustic competition. So when black drum are chorusing, they really drown out everything else. And so if you happen to be another species of nocturnal fish, uh, you may be acoustically displaced because you, by uh, calling black drum because you can't uh, outcompete them. Uh, something similar may be going on with toadfish, uh, but it's unclear. I think another uh, question um, that uh, rises up from some of this, looking at changes in ocean temperature related to the frequency of, of fish sounds is the idea of female mate choice. So, you know, the question of how do, you know, female, we know that females respond um, to the fundamental frequency of fish calls um, 
but is that preference fixed at a, at a, at a certain frequency or does that too uh, shift with temperature as well? And so one of the concerns would be that if the female preference for frequency did not change, even though the male calls are changing as a function of temperature, you then may have a sort of a reproductive mismatch or a, or a preference mismatch um, under a climate change scenario. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, another, uh, the, the last component of sort of ecological significance is a, sort of a fairly simple uh, uh, axiom that, that uh, you know, happy fish are spawning fish and, and that fish ac reproductive activity can be a pretty good indicator of overall ecosystem function. And so we can use reproductive activity um, as gleaned through acoustics as sort of an indicator of overall ecosystem processes. Yeah. Um, Dave is asking, in addition to the fish changing their calls in response to temperature, I'm curious to what degree those same changes in temperature affect how those fish calls travel through the water column. Uh, that's a great question, um, something that we're working on now. One of the difficulties um, with, with trying to answer that question is that shallow water sound propagation is ridiculously complicated. Um, in, the, in Florida Bay specifically, the average water depth across that entire bay is three feet. Um, and you have a number of different uh, sort of banks and troughs. And so trying to understand how sound propagates in those really, really shallow systems uh, is, is difficult, but, that, but absolutely worth looking at. And so we know uh, from array work that we did in Jacksonville, we can pick up black drum uh, about, they've got a, a, a detection range of about 10 kilometers. Um, with 165 decibels. And um, it'd be interesting to see when you have a, a benthic fish like toadfish, it'd be in, useful to know how far those sounds are propagated. It's certainly not 10 kilometers, but what that detection range is um, would, be, would be useful. All right, here might be the last question, mm -hmm. unless someone adds more. Um, you mentioned applying techniques that you've learned from underwater studies to terrestrial studies. Can you speak more about what you've learned that you're now applying to terrestrial studies? Sure. So I'll, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think some of it is this idea of being able to look at the history of the discipline where really uh, large scale acoustics was driven by uh, funding from the U.S. Navy um, for, for marine mammal studies. So this is where a lot of the automated detection algorithms for looking at uh, species specific calls was really developed from. Um, for you know the last 10 or 20 years and only now are people leveraging a lot of those approaches to use automated detection uh, efforts uh, on things like birds and frogs and, and uh, primates um, and so I think you know with the advent of the digital signal processing revolution where it's now really easy to collect data um, the challenge is now analyzing it and a lot of the advent of the uh, of big scale bioacoustics and sort of this like big data idea really comes from what was started uh, in the marine environment. That's great, thank you so much. So here's my, oh, hold on one more. In terms of noise pollution, what are some alternatives to shipping and other activities that are causing noise? Um, so that is, so noise mitigation is really one of the pressing issues in, on the industry. Uh, side of things where uh, uh, both commercial shipping entities as, as well as uh, navies and whatnot are looking at ship quieting techniques to make the, the ships run more quietly. Um, for things like pile driving, there's a number of different um, alternative technologies that reduce the sound footprint coming from, from pile driving. And so trying to figure out if you're going to do operations um, and construction activity in the ocean, how are there ways to continue that, but reducing the overall noise footprint? So that's certainly an active area of both, uh, both research um, and discussion. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for answering all those questions. Sure. We've got them all. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that we recorded this talk and we will post it to our Shoals live stream page, which is on our website, which is shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. Um, feel free to email us if you want a link to that and you can share these. And our next Rock Talk is next Tuesday. Um, a fellow Cornell faculty member, uh, Ian Houston, will be joining us. And he is a biological oceanographer and a microbial ecologist who focuses on viral ecology. And if you've heard of sea star wasting disease, he's really made a big impact on that particular topic. 
Um, so all of this information about all of our events this summer, which we have way more than we normally have for the public, it's all on our website. Again, shulzmarinelaboratory.org. Thank you all so much, especially you, Aaron. Really appreciate that amazing talk. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody take care. Have a great night. I hope to see you again at one of these talks. Good night.